Hey there YouTube, so for this video I wanted to cover a simple example of how to complete the IRS form 8621. Uh, this is an information return uh, for a shareholder of a PFIC. And so what we have in front of us here is a sample 8621 completed. We'll go through this and the rest of the return and how everything is reported. Um, but then I also have um, a slide here with um, some of the general information we need to know and then what our fact pattern is going to look like when we go back to the 8621. So just high level background, a PFIC is a passive foreign investment company, right? So this is a foreign corporation, so it's a non-US corporation. And the activities within the, within the entity make it a PFIC because the assets or the income streams are primarily passive types, right? So a lot of investment vehicles like hedge funds, uh, private equity companies, they're going to be PFIX, right? And so the reason why that's important is if, if a U.S. person owns stock in a PFIC, not only do they have to disclose the holdings on an 8621, but there's very often an income inclusion uh, because, it, because it is a PFIC. Right. And so now what's important about the 8621 is PFIX have certain default tax treatments. So a U.S. person is allowed to keep the default treatment, uh, which is a Section 1291 fund. But it's generally more preferable and desirable from a tax perspective if the shareholder makes a qualified electing fund or QEF election or the mark to market MTM election. Um, and so the mark to market, I'm not going to go over that one on this video. This is an example of a QEF election. Um, so there'll be a separate video on, on MTM elections and those types of PFIX. So what the QEF election does is it requires the U.S. person to include in current income allocations of ordinary earnings and uh, long-term capital gains, right? And this occurs regardless of whether the PFIC actually distributes any cash. So if you think about the corporate mantra, right, the corporation records income, pays taxes, and then the shareholders don't actually record any income until, until they receive cash. That doesn't work in a PFIC context. In a PFIC context, the earnings pass through to you anyway, whether you receive any cash or not. Now, the earnings of a PFIC PFIC, if we're going to make a QEF election, have to be categorized uh, in one of two buckets, right? So the first one is ordinary income, which includes interest, dividends, short-term capital gains, uh, these types of income that are earned within the PFIC. And then the second basket is a long-term capital gains um, uh, character of income. And that's important because obviously when we make an income inclusion, uh, ordinary income is going to be taxed at whatever our marginal rates are. But the long-term capital gain um, income is going to be taxed at that maximum rate, right? So 20% or potentially 23.8% uh, with the net investment income tax. So let's look at the example here, our fact pattern, and then we'll jump back to the 8621. So we have John here. He's a U.S. citizen and a U.S. tax resident. So he's a U.S. person for purposes of these PFIX. So John needs to include an 8621 with his Form 1040 tax return. Um, so on John, uh, January 1st, 2020, John invests 75K into a hedge fund that's a corporation formed in the Cayman Islands, right? So the corporation issues John 15,000 shares, um, and if you look at the corporation's cap table in total, it has 900,000 shares issued and outstanding. So John's beneficial ownership is 1.67%, right? We just do 15K uh, divided by 900,000, and we get the one67 now, during the 2020 calendar year, the hedge fund's ROI was 9%, right? So not a bad year. Uh, so in total, the amount of income within the PFIC, uh, the net income was $405,000. Now, the fund is going to be a PFIC for federal income tax purposes because it's, um, it generates passive income, uh, income streams, and the net assets, or so the assets, 50% of the assets are used to generate passive income. So that's generally what makes it a PFIG. Um, so it goes ahead and prepares these annual PFIG statements for its investors, right? So of the 405k in book income, uh, the PFIG summary statement shows that ordinary earnings of the fund were 125, and then the net long term capital gains were 280, right? So 280 plus 125 is the 405. So, and then also during 2020, there were no dividend distributions to investors, right? So no cash went to John or any other shareholder in this, in this uh, hedge fund. So if we look at John's allocation, he's going to get 1.67%. So he's allocated 
$2,088 of ordinary earnings, right? And then he gets 4,676 of capital gains. Okay, so now how does John go about completing his 8621 and including the income? So if we go back to the 8621. Uh, we have here, we have John Q. Taxpayer, right? He's the shareholder. Um, you know, his social security number up, is up here, the calendar year uh, for the shareholder, right? If you're an individual, you're just on a calendar year, right? 2020. The reason why they have uh, other items here is you could have a U.S. shareholder that's, let's say, a corporation, and it's on a different year end. So if you have a corporation with a June 30 year end, um, it would be you know July 1 to June 30. Uh, but in this case, individuals always use the calendar year. Okay, so then we have the type of shareholder. Obviously, John is an individual. So you know, like I said, any U.S. person, a U.S. person could be either a corporation, partnership, S corp, trust. And so if, if that applies in your case, then you would select the appropriate um, shareholder type. And then down here is when we start to complete information on the PFIC, right? So we have our Cayman Islands Investment Company um, Limited, so it's a foreign corporation. EIN, uh, the entity might have an EIN. A lot of them um, very, very well do now um, because they need it for banking purposes. So if there is an EIN on your um, um, PFIC statement, then go ahead and enter that. Otherwise, you just use a reference ID number, which uh, you make up on your own. So the reference ID number is selected by you. It's your way to identify the type of PFIC that you have here. And you're supposed to use the same reference number going forward each year. So for each year that John has um, an ownership interest in this PFIC, he's going to use the same reference ID number for this entity. Okay. So we have the address of the PFIC, right? They're based out of Grand Cayman in the Cayman Islands, and it's the 2020 tax year. So now here's information on, uh, here's the summary of the information that's going to be included on the other page. So we have John's type of uh, stock. He, he just owns class A common stock, right? Whatever the uh, character of the stock is, enter that into that field there. The date he acquired the stock, right? Jan 1, 2020. Uh, and the number of shares he's got at the end of the year, right? So he bought in, we got 15,000. And he's still holding the 15,000 uh, shares at the end of the tax year. Now, value of the shares, um, you're basically just usually, the, this will be on the PFIC statement. Um, you want to disclose whatever the book value is or the fair value. So if the fund appreciated to, let's say, $5 million in total, um, John would take 1.67% times the $5 million, and wherever that valuation uh, falls, you know, he would select the appropriate box. Now, so the type of PFIC, and the amount of the inclusion. Well, we're going to be electing to treat this as a QEF. So we have part two, uh, we're going to select A, right? We're electing to treat it as a QEF. And then in, in line item 5B, we're selecting 1293 QEF fund. Okay. So now let's get into part three where we actually have the QEF uh, information. So part three, this is completed if we are making the QEF election. Um, and if the election is in effect in, in future years, you would complete this as well. So if you recall on our slide, um, he had no dividend distributions, but his allocation of these amounts, 2,088 of ordinary earnings, uh, 4,676 of capital gains. Okay. So uh, enter pro rata share of ordinary earnings, right? 2,088. And then his pro rata share of the net capital gains, 4,676. Okay. So those are the two uh, income amounts that you were disclosing on this 8621. The rest of the form is left blank um, because in this case, none of these other items apply, right? We don't have 1294 elections or we're out of the 1291 uh, treatment and we're not making a mark to market election. So we complete part three for the QEF and then uh, the summary of the income inclusion is in total is reported there. So 6,764. Now, here's what's really, really important and is often overlooked is completing this form is good. Uh, obviously, it's necessary, but you also need to now include the income in your tax return to pay tax on it, right? You can't make a QEF election uh, without actually including the income into your tax return. So if we go to the very top here, we're going to go to page one of the 1040. So this is John's 1040. Uh, now we're going to look at where we're going to report uh, the income information for both pieces. So if we Go down here to Schedule 1, right? Additional income and adjustments to income. 
Uh, line eight is where we report the ordinary earnings. Remember, um, ordinary earnings just subject to ordinary income tax rates. So we have our ordinary income inclusion from our QEF, uh, 8621, that's the $2,088, right? So this amount is going to be included in John's ordinary taxable income for the year. Now the capital gain inclusion is reported on Schedule D. So if we go to Schedule D, we have capital gains and losses. Part two, because it is long-term capital gains, um, this amount, uh, there's the 4,676, we have a report on line 12. Now, if you know here, it says long-term capital gain and loss in partnerships, S-corps, estates, trusts, and from Schedule K-1s. Um, that doesn't apply here, right? We don't have a partnership. We don't have any K-1s. We got a PFIC statement. But in practice, this is the best place to represent this number, right? So you can still put it there. A lot of tax software programs will default to this, and they even add um, like a little statement here that says Form 8621. That's okay. Really, what we just want to make sure happens is that the amount of long-term capital gain is included in Schedule D, and it's treated as a long-term gain. Okay, I also see some preparers put it on line 13 as a capital gain distribution. Again, that, that's okay. I mean, what we're really after is just make sure in line 15 here, the total net long-term capital gain or loss, uh, we've got that income inclusion down there, okay? Then, after you've got those two pieces entered, everything should eventually flow up to page one. So if we check John's page one here, we have right there, line seven, capital gain or loss, there's our 4,676, and then our other income item, 2,088. So those both, pe both pieces are included in John's uh, taxable income computation. And obviously the, uh, the 4,676 of capital gain will be subject to the maximum, or sorry, not the maximum, but it, it will have a ceiling of 20%. Um, because he does get that long-term capital gain treatment. So that covers it for this video. I hope um, that was helpful. If you have any questions, please leave me a comment below, and I look forward to seeing you again on the next video. Thank you.